David, um, we'll start with, with, a, with a basic question. Um, how did you um, uh, decide to make a film? I think it was Judith, uh, the, your producer is here, Judith Mizrahi, uh, who introduced you to the idea of making a film about James or to him. Yeah, so Judith, um, for a little while, long ago, was the photo editor at the New York Observer. So she worked with James for a couple of years and, um, and knew him from back then. And then I think kind of lost touch a little over the years, but then when COVID was um, kind of in full swing, James started posting a lot of his work on Facebook for his Facebook sort of friends. And so she was discovering a lot of the older work, a lot of the other work she wasn't aware of, you know, from when you'd worked together and was really blown away by it. And she started showing me too. And um, she just threw out the idea of what, it, what would be crazy to, you know, what about a movie about James and his work? So we... Uh, we thought about a little, um, took a little closer look at all that you had done, like I just, in terms of researching and, and um, it was, you know, an incredible career. And it was also, you just seemed like such a, like it, the work hadn't been seen enough was a very motivating thing, I think. Um, and the voices archives, for example, like are not that available. Um, so we- It's terrible. Yeah, so we just met with James, we talked and uh, we got along well and you were already friends with Judith and, um, we kind of just jumped in. Uh, were you were you pleased, uh, surprised, intrigued by the idea of a, of a film made about you? Um, well, I was very anxious about about that because I never imagined I never even imagined my stuff on a wall, you know. So um, I, I never I never sought to have my stuff hanging on a wall. I just love the work, the day to day work. And um, um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> did, <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you two, uh, did you two talk about what the film was going to be like? In terms of shooting it? Yeah, or, yeah, what was going to be like? Well, I think one of our founding, I think it's my sort of things that drew me the, to the project was that I felt like you offered more than just a standard, what a standard photo biopic could be because of the nature of how much you had done, how hard it was to classify um, the range of it. And also just how much you embodied to me the voice and other, and, and you know, this entire era of journalism and you were like a major figure, I think, in that. And uh, like a corner, cornerstone. And I thought that was like establishing some of the importance of that also meant est further establishing kind of the importance of your work in that context, helping to see how that context was also, I mean, it stands alone, kind of like Alexandra said, I think, but also seeing in the context is add something more. Um, so I think we, t we talked a little about that in the beginning and um, we kind of just said, let's film a little, I think, and try it out. Well, I, um, I, th I thought just the most interesting part of my, my career was that I had five staff jobs, all in New York, which was unusual, first of all. Um, consequently, enormous opportunity. Um, to do all kinds of different things. I mean, I was work. I was staff photographer at Harper's Bazaar. Um, I didn't do. I didn't do fashion pictures. I did fashion shows, and I did lots of portraits and anyone I wanted really to photograph. I had the entree of Harper's Bazaar, which is great. Um, and then I, I was at a rock and roll paper. Just all different uh, opportunities, and so I think. I think if if anything uh, makes my career special, it's that you know the wealth of opportunity and and doing a little bit of everything. And you said in the film that you like the idea of being a staff photographer because you like the idea of belonging to. A... I like that. Yeah, I like I like being part of a family or in a group, um, and committed to the same project. And I met met a lot of wonderful writers and worked with them. I loved working with writers. And uh, I met Kathy Doby that way, and um, uh, just had a fantastic time. Uh, and was, it was like a grant, you know, a, a foundation grant or something, all these jobs, because, um, and I've, as I've said before, uh, the life of not knowing what you're going to do from day to day was something I wanted all my life, and that's what happened. 
But, but the amount of independence you had, I think, was the amount of independence you had as a staff photographer was very unusual. I mean, that was the other thing. Um, being part of a group or a family or whatever, and and having art directors that trusted me and I trusted them, they pretty much, I always chose the pictures. I didn't have to compromise. I chose my own pictures. They never cropped them. They treated them with respect, which is unusual. And it's I was never a good freelancer because I was a terrible hustler. So I was glad to be salaried and... Uh, and you know, have that kind of freedom. Uh, there is, I think, it's Richard Goldstein that says that um, the, the voice was this unique blend of art, artistic, you know, creativity and and journalism. Do you think that's part of what uh, made it possible for you to Absolutely. have this freedom? And I think, I think, uh, if you ask any writers, photographers uh, who worked at the Voice in, the, in that in that era. Um, they will tell you it's the best job they ever had, probably, um, because it was it was an exciting time, and and everyone got to do what they wanted to do. How much, David, did you know about this world? It's your different generation, and uh, how, how much did you discover this film while you were making it? Uh, quite a bit. I mean, I, I, the voice. I knew. It, I of course knew the voice from later personally. Um, and I think I had a fair understanding of what the voice meant, like the importance of it to New York and culturally and historically, but I hadn't looked through years and years of the voice and seen James's work and others' work and read some of those articles from the 70s and 80s. And, and so diving in was an incredible learning experience, both in terms of the history of it and and like what that meant, but also just, you know, learning by reading the writers and and looking at the, the photography. Um, so I learned a lot, I, you know, I think. For me, I, I think having the documentary be left very open and free to, you know, develop as it goes and isn't very important. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that was part of it for sure. Um, one of the things in the documentary that really surprised me is is the breadth of different subjects, the subjects that you that you photographed so over over the years. You know, we, you know, upstairs. I hope you, you you come up afterwards. We have a show of his film art, but uh, as you can see, it's war, it's politicians, is rock and roll, uh, is uh, you know the planes. Um, is there a w different way where you approach different subject? How do you, is there something you prefer to do or not to do? The only, uh, I, c I can say that I started. I worked for a fashion photographer, which I didn't want to. I didn't want to be a fashion photographer, but I worked for him, and I and I uh, learned how to work a dark room and that sort of thing. But the fun I was having was was taking pictures in the street and running all over the city, documenting my life really. And so whatever I did in the street, I kind of carried into whatever job I was doing, whether it was a portrait or something like. Because I was taking pictures all the way to, to the job. And then when I got to the job, I still had that sort of attitude of being in the street in a funny, funny way. So, um, so even portraits were sort of uh, they were they could be intimate and they could be um, challenging, but they it was all inspired by what I was doing in the street. So, um, does that answer the question? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and uh, do you have any thoughts on it, uh, David? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I, have more, I have more pictures taken in the street than anything, uh, because that was that was that was the most fun. Well, I, I will add that there is so much street work that he has shot that no one has seen, or very few people have seen that you're still discovering every day, amazing new photographs. That it's astonishing. I mean, really, truly, like this picture in the Bronx. We were going to have a screening at the Bronx Documentary Center, and we were talking about pictures he might have taken in the Bronx that would be like a nice tie-in. And he's got the most beautiful, he pulls up this most beautiful photo of a boy fishing on the Bronx River with this, this you know, elevated subway going by in the back. It's like a painting, it's unbelievable. He's like, oh, this one's good. You know, and I'm like, where was this? You know, where did this come from? Um, so the amount of I think his street work needs to be seen more. I mean, we did what we could putting it in the movie, but there's just a tremendous amount there. 
Wes Anderson always wanted to do a, a, a film book the same way we, I did the music book. Uh, writers, directors, producers, everything, and actors, and um, like the show upstairs. Uh, and then he said, no, nah, we have to do the big book eventually. We, we, thought, we were thinking of ideas for the title and this and that. We were really were serious about doing that book. And then he said, no, we have to do the big book. The big book being everything. It will never happen. <laughs> it will never happen. But, it's but, like the white um, whale of photos. It is a Pandora's box. But, um, you know, I could do some small books, you know, or series or something like that. But to, to I, I, there are just too many subjects. And there's, you know, it's too hard. Um, the past few days, we, we you know we spent some time together while we were setting up the show and, and talking about this. And both of you are are, are cinephile. Can you uh, uh, tell us what role had cinema? We had so much fun because of making this movie. Because all we talked about was movies. It's movies, yeah. All they talk about is films. Yeah. So can you can you <laughs> can you tell a little bit about how? Uh, talking about films or, or film itself, Phantom, and, and, and the relations you developed during making the film? Well, I didn't, I mean, I didn't know that James, the depth of his expertise and knowledge on numerous fronts going in. I mean, I, I do, I, I should add that the set work was also really appealing to us when we were thinking of making the movie and um, that excited us too, because it was just yet another dimension, one that we, we loved. Um, so that was also an appeal, but, I think as we started, I realized like, oh, James, like Wes Anderson says, you know, there's a lot, um, which was wonderful because I learned so much from talking to you. Well, you uh, you asked if I wanted to have a film shown and I immediately thought of Rear Window, which I've seen, I can't tell you how many times, but um, but his lifestyle in the, I, I I had no desire to be a photographer because I didn't know anything about photography. But the idea, again, of doing not knowing what you're going to be doing from day to day, that appealed to me from the age of eight years old. So when I first saw that film, so um, that was uh, that was very inspiring. It planted a seed, I think. It planted a yeah. seed. It planted a seed. Does the uh, raise your hand if you want to ask some question? I'm going to open. One, one more here, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go for you. Um, is that the, I was thinking about the set photography, and, and a lot of the pictures are, are, are up there. That, that speaks to that sense of family that, that, that the Absolutely. staff work has, oh, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you are, you are, it's a traveling circus, you know, and you're very close to everybody eventually. And I, I always thought I had the second best job on the set because I could wander anywhere, and I treated it like a documentary film. So I would, uh, the job mostly entails capturing what the, the movie camera is capturing, then they use for those pictures for publicity. Um, and I, I wrote to Stanley Kubrick when, he was, when I heard he was doing Barry Lyndon, and I thought, what a great set to be on, um, probably. And then, of course, it would have been. But he, he wrote back that um, he didn't use still didn't want to use still photographers. Uh, I don't know who he did use, but um, I sent him a bunch of pictures that I never got back. But, <laughs> but, um, but and, 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 and he would actually use frames from the film uh, often. So um, how did I get on that subject? Uh, Family sets? Yeah, and, and but it's... Um, it's it's a hard job because it's long hours and and all that, but the way I because I treated it as though it were my own project and not something I was doing for them, uh, it made it enormous fun because I was I could go anywhere and wander anywhere on the set and take pictures of anything I wanted and it just uh, again nobody was looking over my shoulder and I, if I could gratify the studio with the pictures they needed. Which were you? You would never. You're never going to get what the the actual movie camera gets, especially with a Wes Anderson movie, because everything is so locked in. So I would run it at the end and grab a picture and then run away. That kind of thing. That's the only way to do that kind of thing. 
But yeah, basically, it's you are you're performing a service by giving the giving the studio publicity pictures, you know. But I never treated it like that. But it's also a service to film history along the way. Yeah. By doing that, I mean that's. I mean, the amount of work we had in that box of prints from Knight Riders, I mean, that's a window into the making of Knight Riders yeah. that's extraordinary. Yeah, and you know, everybody knows George Romero for the zombie movie, for the dawn, you know, the day of the dead, the dawn, night of the living dead. And he made this movie in 81, Knight Riders, which is really unknown, and it's, it's a, it speaks so much of who George was. It's just him. Yeah. It's, it has his, his values, yeah. and, and it's a really strange and beautiful film. So come and see it on Sunday if you can. Whenever I wanted to meet somebody like George or Hitchcock, I would just uh, uh, create a job. So you were telling me the other day that you met Hitchcock twice? You <laughs> I met him twice. Um, yeah, I, uh, well, I encountered him twice. I met, I met him because I wanted to meet him, and then years later he, there was a uh, show. I mean, uh, he, was, he was being honored at Lincoln Center. And so I went to a press conference just to see him again. This was a few years later from the picture that's seen here. But, um, and uh, he was looking really bummed out to be there and very sort of bored with the whole pr process. And I remembered that there was a scene in North by Northwest, and it was a lot of people had seen North by Northwest, maybe. And um, not to give anything away, but I will be giving something away. Um, it's okay. Cary Grant, near, at the end of the movie, is trying to warn Eva Marie Saint that, the, that James Mason is, knows that she's a double agent, and they're going to throw her out of a plane, and they're going to take off. So Cary Grant is upstairs, on, uh, and... and looking down at her and trying to think of a way to warn her that they're going to kill her. So he pulls out his matchbook, which has his monogram on it, and we've seen it earlier in the film, R-O-T. And he writes on the matchbook, inside the matchbook, and then tosses it down to her. And you know, he's wait the suspense is waiting if she's going to pick it up. Uh, eventually, she looks down, picks it up, opens it up, and realizes, he, when she says, uh, I have to go upstairs. You know? And what, uh, he, what he wrote on it was what I decided to write on a matchbook and pass to Hitchcock <laughs> while he was sitting at the table. And it is, they are on to you. <laughs> and then he cracked up. So it's the second, it's the second time I made Hitchcock laugh. Oh, I should just add that just today, James showed me for the first time a photo of Hitchcock at this press conference that I had not oh, really? seen. Looking, Hitchcock looking no, very... Sorry, it wasn't in the movie. Very annoyed to be there and, you know, <laughs> they're on to him for sure. She had a, did you have a question? Hold on. Uh, wait for the microphone. Um, so, did ev anyone ever try to say that you couldn't be a photographer, and how did you reply to them if they said that? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> what I remember most was going to see a very famous photographer. I, I, had, I had hitchhiked around the country um, taking pictures, and I came back, and I processed film, and in my, I built a darkroom, processed the film, and I... I didn't know what I had yet. I wasn't, and I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I just loved doing what I was doing. So I went to a very famous photographer named W. Eugene Smith, who had been a famous photographer for the Mag Life magazine, and and basically I went to him to show him the work and to uh, you know see if he thought I had a future. And. Uh, and he got very excited about one particular picture, and he said, anyone who can take this picture should be a photographer. So that was the most, uh, the, the nicest thing anyone ever said at that point in my life, because uh, I was, I was, it gave me all the confidence I needed to hear it from this very famous, brilliant photographer. So, but no, nobody ever said no. <laughs> uh, after, uh, you know, I mean, I, 
again, I was lucky to get all these staff jobs because I, I had my own realm, you know, I had my own way of working and, and so. I think there's a question there. Uh, question if it's the Vietnam War or the anti-war movement were ever a subject of his photography. Yeah, sorry, you got it. Yeah. Um, in 1971, I was doing a lot of pictures around that. There was a newspaper I was working for called The Herald. And uh, not so much The Voice, but uh, that paper. I, there were a lot of pictures involving the anti-war movement. Does anyone here remember The Herald from 1971? Nobody remembers that. Anyone? Really? There's almost no record of it. It's amazing. Yeah, it had a it had a it had a brief life. It was a giant giant tabloid uh, Sunday paper, and the pictures ran enormously, uh, and um, because there was hardly any advertising, and it, it was uh, beautifully designed by a designer named Massimo Vignelli, who uh, actually designed New York subway map, but um, and it was. Remarkable because of that, and the first I was the, uh, an art director who I was very close with, uh, and I mean I knew from Pratt when I was in art school. Um, he and I were the first hires, um, and then they started hiring uh, writers. But we were the first. That's how much they valued the art. There was a question here. Uh, Hold on for the mic. A, a little technical, I'm sorry, but you said you switched to medium format in like 1985. <laughs> Self-defense. Yeah, I'm just curious, like you you had mastered 35 mil, I mean, and then you, what, why did you make that switch? I'm just I, curious. I, I, well, I was doing a lot of work for New York Magazine. I was doing covers and full pages. And the format is very close to the particular format I switched to, which is called 645. Those are the, and um, so they were cropping my 35 millimeter pictures. And since I didn't want them to do that, I switched formats. And then I fell in love with it, that format, because the quality is so great. It's medium formats, you know, very sharp, very fine grain. Um, and uh, yeah, I loved it. So I started using that camera instead. So that was about 1985. From then on, I used that camera. I, I think a lot of people made a similar switch because nobody wanted to shoot 35 yeah. where you couldn't do a magazine. <laughs> but it was like, I was using that camera to do the stills for, for well, um, uh, Royal Tenenbaums, which is, if anyone, <laughs> First of all, you have to have a blimp around a camera. Blimp is something something that makes the camera quiet. Almost everybody w would work in 35 millimeter with this sort of toaster size thing around the camera. So I would have to run in, as I said before, I'd have to run in and take a picture at the end because this clunk. Uh, and you only had 16 frames per roll. That's right, yeah. But it was, uh, and the studio loved the picture, the quality, you know. There's a question there. Film is uh, this wonderful documentary. So many things. And also, yes. <laughs> and, Thank you. And also, uh, the analog era. It's, uh, I think, especially people who, who maybe don't understand. I mean, you take it to the point of actually how you develop film and so forth. So we're entering the digital era. What are your thoughts on? Photography and film, and as we move into this completely different era of the me digital. or David, me. I feel we're, we are in the digital era now. <laughs> um, I the only re the only reason I was happy about it really because I still love film was um, that I, I I could shoot color film. I mean, shoot color. And it didn't cost me anything extra because uh, color film was expensive, and I, I wasn't really a color photographer, as you may guess. Uh, I mean, I didn't I didn't love color as much as I love black and white. 
uh, and I had full control of my black and white film. Uh, and I love that. I love processing and printing and all that. But color was a whole different thing in terms of processing, and I just never, never took it on that way. Um, and so, so I was. It, the good thing about digital was that it was free color film. You know, but it should be noted that you were basically getting unlimited free film from the jobs for that your. That was true too. Whatever you wanted to do with. I mean. <laughs> I can't, uh, I can't minimize that. So uh, here's a question then. If you were still getting the free film, would you shoot film instead of digital? I would shoot film, probably. Or I can't, some combination. I, it's so expensive now. But, but I was, uh, everything was paid for. All the chemicals, all the paper, all the film was paid for. And if I was out in the street taking my own pictures, I never had to buy film. I didn't buy, I didn't buy film for 40 years. Wow. Uh, or chemicals or paper. I mean, I bought it, but I didn't pay for it. There's a question here. He's been waiting for a while. So if you could do any assignment now or meet anybody now, who is the person you would like to go see? And what is the assignment oh, you'd like to do know. now? I, I can never answer that question. <laughs> I guess the pe the people that I liked engaging with the, the most were artists. I mean, in terms of portraits, if that's what you're talking about, portraits. Um, stories would be a whole other thing. I don't know what, it's hard to say. But um, it, would be, it's, it would be an artist that I never photographed. I wish, uh, for the in terms of the film pictures, I wished... Uh, that I had, uh, I wish that I had spent more time in California because I was always waiting for people to come to New York, and I I, I would love to photograph more film people because for some reason I liked photographing film people I guess. But um, and I, as you'll see, if you go upstairs, upstairs there are, um, they were fun to photograph, film people, writers, directors, everybody. But there's so many more than what's upstairs. Like, I mean, <laughs> there are only a few upstairs. We, we managed to put on those walls more than what you thought we were going to end up putting. I'm glad. I'm glad because so, just getting that number together was... This is only my second crazy. show. The, <laughs> only, the, 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 the only show I had before this was in connection with the music book. I had pictures hanging on the wall. There's a question here, Barbara. Thank you uh, so much for making the film. You and the producer, I'd like to thank you for that. Oh, you got to Thank you. And Julia, I loved your introduction, letting us know how you learned about uh, New York no, and, New York and the know the village. My question for you is this right now. Given that you made this film, I hadn't heard of it until thank you for bringing it here. Where are you going with the film, and will there be more exhibitions, do you think, of Mr. Hamilton's work? Um, well, the film's going to be released theatrically in... Uh, about a month, 26, April 26th. April 26th. We are opening it here with a regular round. So this was like a, a sneak preview that, that we, we did to create this this opportunity to have James and and the photographs. Yeah, so here uh, in, in New York, in the city, at IFC Center, LA, Portland, a couple of other things. And there's some special screenings and some festivals and some different things. And I mean, we're very happy to be screening in a theater, a documentary in a theater right now is you know, not even an easy thing to, to, to achieve. So we're super pleased about that. And um, hopefully, you know, it, it plays well for audiences that way. Um, does that answer your question? What was the other part? Yeah, I would yeah. imagine, uh, particularly because of your mention about the big book, you're not, you say you won't do, but I would imagine with someone like Wes, you could get an exhibit eventually at the Academy Museum in the film. Mm. I'd love it. Yeah, he knows the people there that do it. So yeah, do it. no, I love I, it. I do think we all very much hope and anticipate that one of the uh, additional benefits of the film is just more attention and the possibility of bigger exhibits and uh, more books or whatever, whatever, however the work can come out and be seen in other me in other mediums and ways. We have time for one more. It's right there. Having photographed, you know, 
such a long time um, from a bygone era. If you think what you think the sort of sanitized New York City, it's, um, it, it's, it's a whole different city in a lot of ways because you know people are walking around like this all day, and uh, people are people don't engage seem to engage the same way they used to and. One of my big subjects was kids. I mean, I loved photographing kids, and they're not out there really and they're the way they used to be. Well, people are very sensitive about their kids, and, being and people are very sensitive about having their children photographed, or you know, naturally. Uh, so it's, you know, there are lots of different things about the city now that um, that make it harder to. I think there was one. Yeah, she's she's been very patiently waiting. The last question goes right there. That's a good question, though. <laughs> I mean, it's okay. different. Thanks for waiting, Mary. <laughs> um, I'm curious whether you've had any strategies throughout your career to make your subjects feel more comfortable around you, and I guess conversely, how you've made yourself comfortable around some of your subjects. Um, I was lucky to have really, really interesting subjects almost all the time. So, so. That was one thing, but um, and you know, if I didn't know somebody, I, I would find out about them. Uh, so I wanted to go in knowing what what I was going to having some sort of an idea about the person or what I was going to do. But uh, when I when I f had the opportunity to spend a, a day, a week, or whatever with somebody, that was one thing. Uh, but then it turned into the sort of, I don't know if I mentioned in the movie, but this, they, they call them junkets, where I would be in a hotel room uh, setting up my lights to photograph somebody. And that person had been in three other hotel rooms being photographed. So by the time they got to me, I, I don't know what kind of state they, they would be in. So I had to engage very rapidly. And uh, I would have 10 minutes with somebody. Uh, you'll see that most of the por a lot of the portraits upstairs were like 10, 15 minutes um, with somebody. So it was uh, I had to engage quickly, and I had to make them com feel comfortable at, somehow. And I had I was always comfortable. I think uh, I was for some reason I was never anxious about any, any of these portraits that I did. Um, it was somehow it came easy easily to uh, to me, so so there was never that problem, but I had to make sure that they were not bored, comfortable. So I would engage. I would do much more talking than shooting, because um, that was the only way to to make something happen. So yeah. I think we're going to, we need to wrap this one. And uh, if you have time, come upstairs and see the show or come back and see the show. And thank you, James. And thank you, thank David. You, thank you.